Hi, my name is Sanaz Karami. I'm an internist and I practice um, primary care in Newport Beach, California. This is my partner, Dr. Sean Nikovan, who is also an endocrinologist as well as a trained internist. And we're here today to talk about coronavirus. There's a lot of information out there on social media, on the news, and it's been a little bit difficult for people to figure out what is correct and what is not. So what we're gonna about, talk about today is gonna be based on CDC guidelines and actual medical data. Um, Dr. Nikovan, can you tell us a little bit about what the coronavirus actually is? Absolutely. Coronavirus is a, is a common cold virus, uh, which is actually considered a novel virus. It is a new virus in humans that has established itself. It's called the COVID-19 uh, in 2019. It, it, it is very similar to the SARS virus and also the MERS virus, which was a quite big effect uh, several years ago. Uh, these viruses are originally uh, are considered a zoonotic virus, and that means they are transmitted from animals to humans as a transmission, and they're common to be in bats, camels, cats, and they're being transmitted now to humans through uh, multiple uh, venues, which could be uh, 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 through uh, uh, contaminated feces, water contamination, ingestion. We don't really know exactly the pure mechanism of transmission, but we believe this is this is the postulated theory. I think one of the questions that I, I want to uh, get answered is that, uh, Dr. Karami, can you tell us how do you transmit coronavirus from one person to another person? So coronavirus is thought to be transmitted person to person um, by droplets. What that means is as you sneeze or cough, those droplets, if someone else inhales them, um, they can get infected. If someone sneezes on a surface and you touch that surface and you touch your eye, your nose, your mouth, you can get infected. If someone directly coughs on you and it gets into your um, oral orifices, you can get infected. Uh, there's the question of, can you get aerosolized infection? If it's in the air, can you just breathe it in? And that is not the current mode of infection. I mean, you know, theoretically, if someone sneezes and you directly go and breathe that air, um, you could be breathing in the coronavirus. But really, the main way that people get infected is through droplets um, and touching the surface and touching their face, which is why we keep emphasizing hand washing. And most importantly, do not touch our face because that's how it gets in. Um, Dr. Nikoban, can you tell us the difference between the flu virus and the coronavirus? A lot of people initially kept saying, oh, this is the same as a cold and a flu. What is actually the difference between these two viruses? Uh, great question. The problem is the flu virus and the coronavirus may sound similar, but they really are not similar. The, the mortality associated with the a flu virus is 0.1% maybe slightly even more, but usually 0.1%. So that means if there is a thousand cases, 0.1% of that basically means one person uh, will die from the influenza, uh, which is still a sad outcome. But the difference is with the coronavirus is that if uh, the mortality rate initially from China was meant to be at 2%, but we're learning data from Italy and the Middle East, the mortality is anywhere between 35 to 4%. And that is very concerning. That means for every thousand patients that contract the coronavirus, between 35 to 40 people can actually die from it. And that's catastrophic numbers when you look at mortality, morbidity associated with it. What worries us about coronavirus versus the flu virus is that when you have the common flu, you know it because it rapidly you deteriorate within several hours. You feel very sick and you, everyone knows you've got the flu. You isolate yourself in the corner, you hydrate, you rest, you sleep. You either get really, really worse, which is that 0.1%, or you get better within a day or two. With the coronavirus, unfortunately, due to the incubation period, which can range anywhere between 2 to 14 days, and a recent paper published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in March of 2020, this month, indicates that the incubation period can be up to 5.8 days. So the problem is that uh, I could be infected with coronavirus and I could be communicating with people around me and not know it. And those poor people could be getting infected innocently by me without knowing it. But if I had the flu virus, I wouldn't be associating with anyone because I would be very, very sick. So the high virility of the disease makes it problematic because you spread the virus unknowingly to many people. You touch all the surfaces, you get in contact with people, and then you eventually get sick. That is the big problem with coronavirus because it's a silent nuisance that's causing the medical community to have catastrophic outcomes. 
And so, that is why they keep talking about this 14 day quarantine after you travel, after you could have been possibly exposed, is that there's those 14 days where you may exhibit no symptoms and still be exposing other people. Um, just going back to the mortality rate, uh, Dr. Nikramon, one of the you know things that we're hoping is that the mortality may actually be lower because currently tests are limited both here and in Italy, and we may actually be testing the sickest of the sick. So there may be a lot of people in the population who have mild symptoms who are not getting tested. So if the overall number of cases is higher, then really the mortality may be lower. And you know that is what we're hoping, but currently we don't have the testing ability. So as of right now, we're thinking around 3.5% is what the mortality is. So Dr. Karami, knowing the mortality and the virility of the disease, how would you recommend patients to protect themselves? So, okay, so for this disease, as of right now, we don't have a way of treatment. There's no antivirals, there's no, um, uh, you know, antibiotics, anything you can take. So what you can really do is boost your immune system. What does that mean? Number one is get adequate sleep. That is going to be your best bet if you're rested. Get great nutrition. Make sure you're taking a good multivitamin every day. Hydrating well. Um, and vitamin D. Vitamin D really boosts the immune system, and that is one of the things that we know will help in this situation. Now, earlier, you know, about a week ago and so on, I was sending patients out uh, emails saying, you know, take elderberry. That's an immune booster. But the latest data I just saw coming in today is that actually they do not recommend elderberry because elderberry boosts the interleukins in your system, actually boosts your immune system so much that if you get it, your immune system may have overreact to it and you may actually have a worse outcome. So please don't take anything in terms of immune boost boosters. We don't know how this virus currently reacts and vitamin D and multivitamins are adequate. Um, can you tell me, Dr. Nikravan, a little bit about what about if someone gets sick? What do they do? They have symptoms of runny nose or sore throat. What do they do now? So the most important thing to understand is that coronavirus is a common cold. So it presents itself as a common cold. You may have fevers and you may have uh, respiratory symptoms and you may just get over it uh, within a period of time. But the most important thing is self-isolation. If you have symptoms, you must isolate yourself because there's a good chance that you may recover on your own. The last thing you want to do is spread the virus. So self-isolation is crucial. Social isolation is crucial. Just because the uh, the offices are closing, you know, your job is like limiting you to, it doesn't mean you can go to the bars and restaurants and etc. We've been recommending patients for now over three weeks to stop traveling, to not go to the airport, to keep themselves in isolation, to stock up on some food and necessary items, to minimize their exposure to the outside. Just don't go out to the restaurants because when you go to the restaurants, they're using forks and utensils and whoever's preparing your food, you have no idea if those people are infected or not. So social isolation is the key because that's how you can break the link. If we don't break the link, this will continue. We have to take a step ourselves to prevent this from progression and not depend on others ourselves. So one thing I want to say that, what about those patients who have risk factors? How do you go about those risk factor patients? How would you deal with them? In terms of um, testing, you mean? So now let's say you are isolating, you're doing all the right things and you're at home and you have sore throat, you've got a little bit of a dry cough, you're wondering, okay, do I have the coronavirus? So as of right now, our recommendation is to reach out to us, reach out to your primary care doctor, um, let us know the symptoms you're having. If they're mild, we usually tell people, well, let's watch, let's see how you do. Take Tylenol if you have a fever, body aches, avoid NSAIDs, which are Advil, ibuprofen, because people tend to do worse with this dis uh, disease when taking NSAIDs. If your symptoms get a little bit worse, and especially just like Dr. Nicola was saying, if you do have underlying heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, then we're going to arrange for you to get tested through Hogue Health Services. Um, if you're actually having shortness of breath and experiencing difficulty, you know, walking around, weakness and so on, then we need to get you admitted. But you need to let us know, you need to, if you are calling 911, let them know that there is this concern so they can be prepped, they can wear the appropriate precautions when you come to the ER and make sure that other people do not get exposed. So basically, reach out to us. If you think you have symptoms, reach out to us and we'll direct you to the next step and we'll figure out how you can get tested. Um, Dr. Nikovan, one of the things that um, we wanted to find out is should we go to you know our regular visits to hospitals you know should i do a teeth cleaning you know i've got an eye appointment coming up what do you think of that that's an excellent question so uh the answer is uh, the absolutely not i would postpone all routine visits 
at whatever expense it is because you don't want to be exposed to hospitals, doctors' offices, because that's where the uh, pandemic disease process will spread itself because sick people will seek care. Uh, currently in our office, both Dr. Karami and I are nonstop on our phones, through our emails, we're doing televisits on the computer, virtual live conferences with patients. The practice is as is, it's just we're not doing physical visits to protect not only the patients, but also protect the practice. And at the same time, protect getting anyone else sick, which is very, very important during that phase. So please reach out to us if you have any questions because the practice is as is through all the electronic modalities. What available. do you think about um, elective surgeries? I've had patients calling in, you know, they need a foot surgery, um, hand surgery. What do you think about elective surgeries? I think all elective surgeries should be canceled because number one, it exposes the people to risk. Unless you have an emergent surgery, you were diagnosed with a malignancy and et cetera, then that case needs to be individualized. Risk versus benefits have to be outweighed. And that's the most important thing. But far as elective surgeries, I would say everything has to be on hold for now. And one other thing that we could, you know, just ask you, please, the delay elective surgeries. The other reason is that um, every time you go into surgeries, there's gowns that'll be used, um, gloves that'll be used. And the biggest problem that we're going to run into is that we're not going to have enough protection in terms of doctors being able to wear gowns, masks, and so on. So we need to save these for the when the wave really hits and people need to get intubated and into the ICU. So we really need to minimize elective surgeries and keep everything for sick patients that come in with COVID and need to be hospitalized. So we recommend absolutely canceling anything that's elective. Absolutely. One thing that I was brought up to the question is about hand sanitizing and hand washing. Can you comment on a hand sanitization, hand washing, what techniques they should use and how long uh, and what products they should use? Actually, I think you studied that better, so I'll pass that back on to you. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so we, we believe based on the, the guidelines that we've looked at and the time it takes to the kill the virus and the microbes is that you need uh, at least a 20-second hand wash with soap and water. Uh, and you, I would just count those seconds. If you're using a hand sanitizer because you can't wash, because washing hand is number one, hand sanitizing is number two, then you would want to use hand sanitizer that has a gradient greater than 60%. Typically, the good ones are ranging between 67 to 70 percent. So you want to hand sanitize of alcohol, of, of, of alcohol yes, of, uh, alcohol exactly. And if you want to sanitize an area, for example, an item that you have, you want to sanitize it, and you don't want to waste it. What we could also recommend, based on CDC guidelines, is taking a one gallon water and putting five tablespoons of Clorox bleach in it, mixing it, and then taking a wipe and actually wiping that surface down. If you're trying to uh, uh, minimize your uh, uh, loss of sanitizing. And that's one thing that we can use in that aspect of it too. So I think that's very, very important. Hand washing, social isolation. Uh, uh. On the you know issue of social isol isolation, I think that's where I've got the most questions since um, you know everything's been on the news. So a couple things. Um, can you go out for a walk? What kind of exercise can you do? So as long as you're going by yourself or you're going with someone and observing that six foot distance, playing tennis, those are fine. We do not recommend you go to a gym or a closed place. Um, what about, you know, your grandkids visiting you or having a play date over for your kid? So now every time someone comes into your circle, there is a risk. However, if this social isolation goes on for more than this 14 days, which we suspect it will, let's say it goes on for a month or two, it is going to get difficult if we have no contact with our loved ones. So what we're telling people is if the people you socialize with, let's say your kids or your grandkids, if they've had a period of good seven to eight days where they're not exhibiting symptoms, they're not socializing with other people, they're isolating, then it's okay for you to socialize with them as long as you keep that group small. Same thing for your kids' friends. If they're not going out and they're self-isolating well, and there's been a good period of time where they're not exhibiting any signs, then let's say after seven, eight days, um, 10 days, then you can have your kids play together. You know, I mean, it's not exact. There's still going to be some risk, but I think that's the best we can go and do in this situation. So, so the purpose of this video was to bring to you our knowledge. Dr. Karami and I are dedicated to our patients and our practice. We have a great staff that are continually working with us uh, uh, throughout the time. And we have together uh, uh, most likely over uh, 40 years of clinical training together. So we really care about our patients. We're definitely dedicated to our patients' care. And we took an oath to take care of our practice and our patients. Uh, and we wanna make sure your questions were answered. So please don't feel abandoned. We're here with you, we're here for you, and we will do everything necessary 
to get through this together. And we're a team, remember, we have to all play a part in this together. We can't depend on anyone. We have to depend on each other to educate each other and protect each other because at the end of the time, we're all human together. And, you know, just to let you know, we're spending somewhere close to, you know, six, seven hours a day almost researching this for new things that come out. I'm on multiple different forums. Dr. Nikaban is in touch with multiple different specialists. So things are changing quickly. And as we get new information, um, we'll bring it to you and we'll send out more videos, more emails and let you know on anything that we find out. Please feel free to reach out to us as well. We encourage you to share this video with uh, uh, all your friends and family because it's, hopefully it's educational. You're more than welcome to join us and follow us on Instagram in which we'll post the information and also Facebook. I hope this information has been helpful to you. Uh, we will fight and continually to make the best outcomes for us and Thank you guys. You. Thank you.